trafficking in recent years, but poaching is still hovering at crisis levels. The number of Asian elephants has declined by roughly a third over the last 10 years. Rhino populations have been decimated with only about 30,000 left in the wild. The most trafficked mammal in the world, the pangolin, is seriously endangered, and the list goes on and on. And this is just wrong. I don't want the next generation to grow up only knowing about elephants from the history books. We cannot allow these wonderful animals to disappear forever. But one of the main reasons we talk about this issue here in the Foreign Affairs Committee is that we have a national security interest in putting a stop to wildlife trafficking, just like trafficking in drugs, weapons, and people, wildlife trafficking feeds corruption, undermines the rules of law, threatens <coughs> economic prosperity, and drives instability. Thanks to Chairman Royce, the End Wildlife Trafficking Act became law in 2016. And today, the administration is coming up with a strategy to ramp up cooperation with the 26 countries that are major sources, transit points, or consumers of wildlife trafficking, what we call focus countries. We also need to pay more attention to the three countries designated as countries of, of concern in which government officials are complicit in the illegal wildlife trade. There are a range of things we can do to tackle the problem of wildlife trafficking. We can partner with other governments to train park rangers and equip them with cutting edge technologies to counter poachers. We can help identify and take down the international criminal networks responsible for so much of the illicit wildlife trade and we can support efforts to reduce the demand for wildlife products. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on their important work in these and other areas. One final point when it comes to conservation, the elephant in the room, so to speak, is climate change. All our efforts to protect habitats <coughs> and species <coughs> will mean nothing if we don't protect the environment upon which all these animals and all of us depend, literally. Every country in the world except the United States is now party to the Paris Climate Accord aimed at curbing climate change. We cannot speak credibly on the issue of wildlife trafficking if we continue to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world when it comes to climate change. So again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your work through the years on this important issue, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Engel. This morning, I'm pleased to welcome our panel of distinguished guests to the committee. We have Ms. Gretchen Peters. She is the director of the Center on Illicit Networks and Transnational Organized Crime. We have Mr. David Stewart, Executive Vice President and General Counsel for Vulcan. Vulcan is a philanthropic foundation that develops new technology to combat poaching and sustainably manage national parks. And we have Dr. Elizabeth Bennett, Vice President for the Species Conservation at the Wildlife Conservation Society. And we appreciate them making the trek to be with us here today. And without objection, the witness's full prepared statement will be made part of the record. The members are going to have five calendar days to submit any statements or questions or any extraneous uh, materials for the record. So if you would, Ms. Peters. Uh, We'll start with you if you want to summarize your, your remarks for five minutes, and after the three of you are done, we'll go to questions. Thank you, Chairman Royce, Ranking Member Engel, and distinguished committee members for inviting me here today. It is a great honor to have an opportunity to comment on U.S. policy towards the global illegal wildlife trade. I run CINTOC, a strategic intelligence organization that supports governments and foundations to find and disrupt hidden criminal networks, not just wildlife networks, but all types of crime. If you remember just one thing that I say today, please remember this. There are just a handful of powerful crime syndicates that traffic the majority of illegal wildlife products moving from Africa to Asia, and we know who they are. These networks can and should be the target of our national security and law enforcement apparatus uh, not just because they are wiping out iconic species like the elephant, the rhino, and the pangolin, but for all the dangerous activities that they engage in, from smuggling people, drugs, weapons, selling uranium to Iran, deforestation, and illegal mining. This is an organized crime threat, 
and a national security threat, and we must begin to treat it as such. On the positive side, uh, we don't need any new laws to target these networks. As uh, Chairman Royce went through some of the recent legislation that has been passed that is terrific, uh, existing legislation on transnational organized crime is well equipped to take them down. And I applaud Congress and both the Obama and Trump administration for sharpening our laws on wildlife crime in particular. I have three points uh, to make today. One, focus on the networks. We, what we do need is a properly resourced, multinational, multi-agency task force focused on these key networks operating between Africa and Asia. To a large extent, the U.S. government continues to treat wildlife crime as a conservation problem, managing and resourcing programs to re reduce wildlife crime separately from other anti-crime activities. This stovepiping stifles interagency collaboration. It causes inefficiencies that ultimately hinder the effectiveness of law enforcement efforts. And it also causes missed opportunities to target the transnational organized crime networks for the myriad crimes they commit. We have witnessed this convergence around the globe. In parts of Africa, wildlife crime funds terrorists, insurgents, violent bandits, and rogue states like North Korea. From Mexican narcos smuggling fish bladders to Iranian-backed networks moving uranium and ivory, crime networks that traditionally smuggled only drugs, guns, and people have diversified into smuggling wildlife and timber because it represents high-profit, low-risk alternative. Now, I'm not saying that wildlife crime converges with other serious crime at every step of the illegal wildlife supply chain, but, and I am not suggesting that we need to send SEAL Team 6 into the Okavango Delta to protect animals. That would be ridiculous. What I am saying is that we need our security apparatus focused on the powerful transnational crime syndicates uh, that are moving illicit goods transnationally. These are also the crime syndicates that are financing poaching. We have had some real law enforcement success stories here in the United States, including Operation Crash and Operation Jungle Book. I also supported a DEA operation to extract four smugglers from Kenya on narcotics charges last year. The two of those smugglers were also part of the largest uh, ivory trafficking ring on the Swahili coast. However, uh, what I've observed also is that governments in Asia, Latin America, and Africa have neither the political will nor the investigative, prosecutorial, and, or nor legislative capacity to take on the most powerful crime networks that are moving wildlife and other illicit goods. The U.S. can and should take action against major crime net syndicates using U.S. extraterritorial legislation while also expanding technical uh, and financial assistance to range and transit states to strengthen their own ju criminal justice responses to wildlife crime. I urge the U.S. Congress to resource a transnational effort to investigate, analyze, and interdict the most cri powerful crime networks operating between sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Let's not just focus on wildlife crime, let's get them for all of their illegal activities. Two, we need to build constituencies. The U.S. government needs to engage trusted partners in the NGO and conservation community, some of whom are sitting on literally terabytes of data about wildlife trafficking networks that intersect with U.S. international and regional security interests. This engagement should be handled privately and quietly. Many organizations fighting wildlife crime and human trafficking in Asia, Africa, and Latin America are doing so at great personal risk to themselves. We also need to be sharing analysis about these convergence patterns with foreign security officials in Asia in order to spur their cooperation. Authorities in China, Malaysia, Vietnam, and other consumer nations are not concerned about the wildlife trade, but they will likely take a greater interest if they realize its close connection to the illicit drug trade, which does worry them. Three, we need to break the systems supporting wildlife crime. It's too easy for criminals to hide in the cracks in the global financial transport and communications system. We at Syntalk have been focused this year uh, on the social media industry. There is an astonishing amount of wildlife being traded on U.S. publicly listed social media firms, including Facebook and WeChat. Having analyzed thousands of posts for illegal ivory on social media, Syntalk has concluded that social, the social media industry is a primary enabler connecting illegal wildlife traders to customers in a marketplace that is global, anonymous, and at this point, completely free of regulation. These firms are literally facilitating the elephant's extinction. 
The National Whistleblower Center has filed complaints to the Securities and Exchange Commission about this illegal activity. And if Congress wants action now, it should urge the SEC to utilize its regulatory power against these U.S. publicly listed firms. I also urge Congress to enact legislation along the lines of what banks face with regards to money laundering. Social media firms should have to report suspected criminal activity and collaborate with law enforcement to take it off their platforms. So three key points today. Focus on the networks, we know who they are. Two, resource a transnational law enforcement effort and diplomatic effort to target these big networks. And three, clean up the systems that facilitate wildlife crime that we can impact right here in the United States. Thank you for taking the time to hear what I have to say. Uh, th thank you, Ms. Beavers. And, and we are involved with F Facebook in terms of the points you raised in order to try to get them engaged uh, uh, in the coalition to take decisive action on this. We, we, go, we go now to our next, uh, uh, Mr. David Stewart, our next panelist here. Chairman Royce, Ranking Member Engel, members of the committee, I'm honored to appear before you today to discuss park management, wildlife trafficking, and poaching. I also want to thank you for your leadership in conceiving and passing the End Wildlife Trafficking Act during the last Congress and continuing to further this important work with the Delta Act during this Congress. Volkan is proud to support both impactful pieces of legislation. I will start my testimony today with a positive comment about this terrible crime. Across administrations, across the aisle, and across our government, poaching and wildlife trafficking are increasingly being recognized not only as an environmental tragedy, but as an urgent threat to U.S. national security interests. This shift in thinking is essential to tackling this challenge. The focus must now be on how we bring government, business, and philanthropy together to harness our combined power and resources to take on wildlife trafficking, to dismantle these criminal networks that are driving it, and to preserve our natural heritage while protecting global security. Today, I'd like to feature what Vulcan is doing to support these efforts, and I'll start with a brief video clip, hopefully. As highlighted in the clip, the 2016 Great Elephant Census provided urgently needed and previously unavailable data on the size and distribution of savanna elef elephant populations across 18 range states in Africa, identifying where they and other spe species had been most impacted by poaching and where conservation efforts were working well. We unfortunately discovered a population decline of 30 percent in those seven years, which accelerated over that period. Also featured in the clip is the El Abu Concession, our 455,000-acre wildlife reserve in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. There, we operate two safari camps, our own anti-poaching force, fund conservation-related research, including development and operation of drones for integration into anti-poaching operations, and work with local communities. My written testimony goes into detail about our park management approach, but in summary, we focus on actively securing the park against poaching, operating businesses such as safari camps that provide tangible benefits to the local communities through employment, through commitment of revenues to build local infrastructure, so that communities see wildlife as an asset that will ultimately reward them, wildlife crime as a threat to that asset and their well-being, and prevention of such crime as their responsibility. Our on-the-ground park operations, along with broad engagement across Africa with the GEC, demonstrated to us the overwhelming amount of data that needs to be captured in order to effectively protect elephants and other wildlife. Therefore, we developed a product called DAS, which stands for Domain Awareness System. DAS is a military-style command, control, and communication system for conservation. It integrates many different data sources and enables park management in real time to visualize wildlife, rangers, 
and potential illegal activity that threatens them, and to deploy the rangers and other resources to interdict the illegal activity before they can harm the wildlife. This enables park managers to make immediate decisions to efficiently deploy resources for interdiction and active wildlife management. DAS is currently deployed in 12 parks in eight countries in Africa, including three that have been identified as focus countries by the U.S. State Department. Among many other countries we plan to deploy DAS next, six of them are U.S. focus countries. Moving beyond park operations, Vulcan is also providing resources to organizations like the PAMS Foundation and the National and Transnational Serious Crime Investigation Unit in Tanzania. The Wildlife Crime Prevention Project and Conservation South Oangwa in Zambia and the Lalongwe Wildlife Trust in Malawi. In particular, NTSCIU has in recent years been instrumental in over 1,400 arrests and 360 prison sentences issued for wildlife crimes. In the years to come, Vulcan will have invested upward, upwards of $60 million in terrestrial and maritime technologies to counter wildlife crime. We don't expect to recoup this investment, but we also know we can't scale it alone. We're pursuing public-private partnerships with relevant governments and international organizations to bring our tested technologies to scale. Thank you for your tireless work on these issues, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, David. Doctor? Thank you very much. Chairman Royce, Ranking Member Engel, and members of the committee, thank you for providing this opportunity to testify. Please accept my submitted testimony for the record as I'll summarize that today. WCS is deeply concerned by the alarming rate of species decline due to illegal hunting, trafficking, habitat loss, and human-wildlife conflict. I'll summarize what's working, identify gaps, and recommend where the US government and Congress in particular can assist. WCS was founded in 1895 with the goal of saving wildlife and wild places. Today, we work in more than 60 countries and across the world's oceans. Our work is grounded in high-quality science and in strong, long-term partnerships with governments, local communities, and indigenous groups. Poaching for the illegal wildlife trade is devastating many species around the world. A hundred years ago, up to 100,000 tigers roamed Asia. By 2011, that was down to just about 3,000. African forest elephants declined by 62% over 10 years due to killing for their ivory. Many other species are affected by high levels of poaching for the trade, for the medicine, food, and pet trades, such as pangolins, songbirds, parrots, tortoises and turtles, sharks and rays. Many large charismatic species threatened by trafficking play key ecological roles. Their loss has many implications, including loss of food security for marginalized rural people and reduced resilience to climate change. The illegal trade is often driven by organized criminal groups with links to other forms of organized crime. And that weakens rule of law and security for communities living alongside wildlife. In recent years, the world is taking this threat seriously. The UN General Assembly has passed three resolutions on wildlife trafficking. The US government expanded the executive order on transnational organized crime to include wildlife trafficking. And thanks to the leadership of Chairman Royce and Ranking Member Engel, wildlife crime serve as predicate, predicate offenses to federal money, money laundering prosecutions. Preventing poaching requires the establishment of protected areas and managing them effectively. WCS, with partners, developed the GPS-based software enforcement program, SMART, which is now deployed in over 600 sites in 55 countries. In addition to increasing patrol efficiency, this increases transparency and helps reduce corruption. With long-term programs and sufficient investment, poaching can be curtailed. In Hue Ka Kang National Park, Thailand, in the past 10 years, tiger numbers have increased by 50%. With the critical support of USAID's CARPE program, WCS in Northern Congo's Nuabali and Doki National Park trains rangers and conducts smart patrols. Forest elephant numbers there have remained stable since 2006, even while they've plummeted across much of Central Africa. WCS works with governments and other law enforcement partners to dismantle wildlife trafficking networks. With the vital support of USAID, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and INL, we've achieved measurable success. 
In Indonesia, WCS's Wildlife Crimes Unit gathers intelligence and assists law enforcement. Since its formation in 2003, more than 1,000 prosecutors have been trained. 70% of the tiger criminal networks in northern Sumatra have been dismantled, and more than 600 suspects have been arrested with a sentencing rate of over 90%. Support from INL is also helping us to act at transcontinental levels. We're working along key trade routes, such as the one between Mozambique and Vietnam and China. Even though we are having success, we're not bringing this up to scale. Urgently needed is continued US government funding. WCS is deeply concerned about the administration's proposed cuts to critical programs to combat wildlife trafficking in the FY19 budget. We thank the 74 members of Congress and 26 senators who urged appropriators to fully restore cuts at a time when so much more needs to be done. These include restoring level funding for the USAID biodiversity program, CARPE, and for that uh, to commit to a fourth phase, the Combating Wildlife Trafficking Initiative implemented by INL and USAID, and the US contribution to the GEF. Regarding the End Wildlife Trafficking Act, we urge this committee to ensure full consultations with NGOs operating in focus countries. And regarding the Delta Act, we urge the committee to fully integrate protected area management and land use planning into the strategy. We appreciate that the US government has successfully raised the profile of wildlife trafficking as serious crime and provides tools and attaches overseas to tackle it. But it's vital that the US continues to demonstrate its leadership on the global stage. We need focused, coordinated action and leadership if the world's wild species and vulnerable people living alongside them are to thrive to future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, as, uh, as you indicated, Dr. Bennett, you had a situation there where the tiger numbers have increased by 50 percent uh, in, uh, in the parkland there in Thailand as a result of these patrols. And the real question is, what is the most effective steps we can take? Under the End Wildlife Trafficking Act, we've had some comments from uh, Ms. Peters about uh, Operation Crash and Operation Jungle Book. Uh, and I would, I'd ask you, uh, Ms. Peters, what have we learned from these operations and how can law enforcement better util utilize the authority uh, that we've given them here. Now we've got the working group. Uh, as you see, the S as you say, the SEC should uh, use its regulatory authority uh, to to push uh, as well on Facebook. Give us your thoughts there. How can we better coordinate this interagency process? How how can we get these convictions? Um, Chairman Royce, I think there have been some some real successes, as I said, um, in these uh, U.S. based operations. Um, and uh, both Operation Crash and Operation Jungle Book, which involves cooperation between U.S. Fish and Wildlife and uh, Homeland Security and Customs, um, are, are examples of that. I think where we, um, where there's room for more interagency collaboration, uh, is in the international sphere. Those were both operations here in the United States. Uh, the real critical threat to wildlife. Um, outside of the social media issue. The real critical threat to wildlife is uh, in other parts of the world. The enormous amounts of um, uh, ivory, pangolin scales, rhino horn that are being trafficked from Africa to Asia in particular, and, and other products, um, environmentally sensitive products, uh, rare hardwoods, uh, tropical fish, et cetera. Um, there's been a real increase that I've observed in Africa in cooperation between the Drug Enforcement Administration and Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement. The Drug Enforcement Administration is also collaborating now for the first time in its history uh, with conservation groups. I was just on the phone with uh, uh, an agent uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I won't say which country, yesterday who was trying to get information from me about wildlife trafficking uh, networks in that country. Um, they are starting to recognize, or they, I should say that agency very mu organization very much recognizes that um, the uh, networks that are trafficking wildlife are also moving dangerous drugs uh, and that they can, uh, they can get better wins from, from collaborating with them. Um, 
this, and so this is an area where I think we can get more cooperation. I also want to take a moment to uh, thank you, Chairman Royce, for your support during the operation. We, we supported um, in Kenya. The ICCF was absolutely instrumental in helping us get those four men extracted from Kenya. Um, not just your um, members here in Congress pushing uh, the administration to ask Kenya to have them uh, extradited, but also Dr. Amina Abdallah, the head of the ICCF in Kenya, brought together a whole group of, of Kenyan con uh, Congress members um, and pushed the Kenyan government as well. So that type of uh, legislative or congressional support is, is, um, is another area where I think we can have real, um, real improvement. And I think there can be real engagement uh, in consumer nations to help uh, the Chinese and the Vietnamese and the Malaysians in particular um, understand uh, the links between, uh, or the convergence between narcotics, weapons trafficking, human trafficking, and the wildlife trade. The same networks that have the capacity to move a container of heroin through a, the global transport system have the capacity to move a container with uh, ivory or pangolin scales. And it's, go, it's following the same routes. We've mapped the supply chains um, that are moving um, heroin from Afghanistan into Africa. In some cases, the seizures have the same, um, the same bags from Pakistan with uh, Pakistani rice on them. It's the same, uh, the, the paths aren't exactly the same. The drugs are coming in some right. cases out of Afghanistan right. into yeah. the Swahili coast. Then it gets repackaged and goes back uh, to Asia. The boats go back to Asia. Um, there's intersections um, with uh, human trafficking, particularly with regard to the rhino horn trade in, in uh, Mozambique and um, uh, South Africa that going in, uh, uh, into Vietnam. So uh, there's a there's enormous that, amount that, of That's data why we've got the task exploited. force. We just, we just want those tools that you've laid out. We want them to apply them effectively in doing their job. Uh, Stuart, I've got to ask you, Mr. Stewart, uh, how do we how do we best get the buy-in from the people that uh, call these areas home? How do we ensure that they feel the benefits of conservation in the Okavango River Basin, where you know obviously we're going to need their their involvement? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think there's uh, at least three components to that: creation of incentive structures, education, and storytelling. Um, in our experience, local communities will reliably and consistently participate in conservation efforts only if they see tangible benefits from preserving the wild animals and the natural resources therein. Um, we can do that through employment. Um, tourism provides a great opportunity for that, and that's something we've done. So it provide jobs for free people who live in the local communities, use revenues from those businesses to build up infrastructure like basics, boreholes for water, um, building schools, uh, providing food for students um, at school. Um, and again, that gives some buy-in so that when these wild animals are not just the things that endanger their kids, knock down their fences and eat their crops, but they're actually an asset they, they see they've got, they've got an interest in and see the benefit from that. That, I think, helps build the political will for them to want to take wildlife crime seriously and support those efforts as well as provide intelligence to the efforts. I think education. You know, it's unfortunate that many people that live right along the borders of parks are completely disengaged from what goes within and from seeing the animals that live therein and the benefits that come from that. So, um, you know, it's important to engage community members at a young age, programs and initiatives that involve school children, conservation clubs at school that both um, are funded by conservation or teach about conservation. And finally, storytelling. You know, our Vulcan Productions Unit has, done, has uh, done a number of documentaries and television series that explore conservation wildlife issues relating to wildlife trafficking. But it's important to show those not only here in the West, but in the, Af the elephant range states and the places where these other wildlife live. So we've brought the, our documentary, The Ivory Game, to communities in Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, and Malawi are working with local schools and nonprofit organizations to showcase the story of what's happening to the animals that live in those countries, and working closely with the U.S. embassies to use these films for community screenings where poaching and wildlife crime is a frequent Thanks. reality. Thanks, Mr. Stewart. We go now to Mr. Engel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I, I think obviously we should do everything possible through uh, technology, uh, law enforcement, and other means to prevent poachers from slaughtering threatened species. But as long as there's a demand for ivory, rhino horn, and other wildlife products, there obviously are going to be people willing to take the risk to supply that demand, and we obviously won't be able to stop all of them. So it seems to me that we also need to focus on reducing demand. So let me, let me ask you, Dr. Bennett, since you really have, uh, I'm aware of Wildlife Conservation Society and the good work you do, um, tell us what we can do to better convince consumers, uh, mainly in Asian countries, to stop buying these products. And I know we've seen ad ad advertisements from time to time with celebrities and, and horrific pictures of dead elephants. H have those advertisements and pictures made a difference? And uh, what other approaches might be uh, effective that we're not doing that we should do? Thank you very, very much, Ranking Member Engel, for that. Um, the, it's, it's an extremely good question because uh, at the end of the day, while there's still the demand, as you say, there will still be the poaching. Um, the one thing that can be done is just straight change the law, which China has done for, for ivory. There was a National Geographic survey done a few years ago now, which asked members of the public in China what would cause them to stop buying ivory. And the single greatest answer was, if it's made illegal. And that's now been done. It's been made illegal, which is, which is great. And now there's the tool of enforcing it and taking it off the market. That doesn't actually necessarily reduce people wanting to buy it and buying it through the black market. And one of the real concerns is that um, uh, people from China and Vietnam will actually go to other countries with weaker laws and weaker law enforcement on their borders. So go and take a holiday in Laos or, or Cambodia and, and bring back some wildlife products. It's a very hard one to answer. Um, we know a lot about the science of stopping poaching and a lot about how to stop trafficking. There's no one clear answer to how to change people's behavior. Um, and a lot of people have tried different things, um, but it's not very clear what, what changes people's behavior. Uh, so for example, within China for shark fin, there was, um, there's been a lot of campaigns, including using celebrities about buying shark spin, um, which have probably had quite an effect in building up a groundswell. But the single thing that took shark spin off the market was President Xi Jinping saying this is a sign of sort of corruption and affluence and luxury and stopped government officers um, buying shark spin. So it's, it's, it's really hard to know. Um, and legal uh, bans themselves don't necessarily uh, change demand. In fact, for some things such as pangolin, people uh, buy it because it's illegal, and that gives an additional status because it shows that you're above the law. So it's a very complex question. We don't actually know the answer. There is a project going on at the Oxford Martin School in UK for three years at the moment to examine exactly that question. What do we know and what works, and therefore how can we change our programs in future? Well, thank you very much. Mr. Peters, let me ask you this. You note that Facebook has become a major platform for selling illegal wildlife products. Um, tell me how you think they're acting. Do you think Facebook is taking this problem seriously, and have you seen any improvements in their practices? Uh, does the same problem exist on other websites or other social media platforms? Um, yes, the, the problem exists on a number of, of social media platforms. Uh, Facebook in particular has been made aware of this problem um, multiple times um, over the past few years. Um, the Wildlife uh, Justice Committee held a two-day seminar in The Hague in 2015, and I don't believe Facebook sent, even sent anybody. Um, so a two-day seminar was held about the problem. A number of uh, reports have been published by WWF, by IFA, and other organizations detailing the problem. Um, and um, Facebook and a number of other tech firms um, have joined a coalition promising to remove wildlife from their platforms um, by 2020. Um, our investigators were online um, looking at the issue just last week, and it was business as normal. Um, I think that the days for um, 
um, talking to the leaders of social media firms about this uh, are over. They've been told multiple times by multiple organizations, including um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement, that this problem is, exists, uh, and they've done nothing you about know, it. You know, Ms. Peters, we had uh, Mr. Zuckerberg here about three or four weeks ago. I'm so sorry that we didn't ask him this question. A, a number of members did ask him about it. He said he was, he was aware it was a problem and that they were working on it. Um, I think they would work a lot faster if the threat of a multi-million dollar fine from the SEC was hanging over their heads. And um, if I may, thank you. Uh, let me ask Mr. Stewart, since I've asked the other two questions. Um, the administration in its, in its FY 2019 budget unfortunately proposed significant reductions for wildlife trafficking and other key international conservation programs. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the impact um, those proposed funding levels have on our ability to effectively address these issues. Obviously, with less money, you can do less, but where do you see it impacting? Well, clearly more resources are, um, are good for the effort. Certainly, I think fish and wildlife having attaches in various embassies throughout Africa have been a great force. Um, we've been more focused, though, I think, in terms of what to do, given the situation, in trying to encourage public-private partnerships to make sure that government funds that are available and are spent are spent more as effectively and efficiently as they can be. And I think a great example of that is the, uh, the bill sponsored by a number of members of the committee, the Delta Act. Um, it's important that the call there, I think, for government to work with business and to work with philanthropy in developing technology and applying uh, efforts across those areas I think is at least what we're trying to be involved in to make up for any reduced funding on the government part. And um, I think that provides a great path. And it's important as we embark on that, as the Delta Act calls for, to if we're going to go in and try to work with Angola to listen to Angola. And I think the up upcoming CODEL that this committee is undertaking is an important opportunity to build relationships with the legislatures and officials in Angola. In our discussions with Angola, there's been an interest in, I've heard an interest in diversifying the economy, the economy. and when we look at the promise in Kwanda Kabango in southern Angola, um, there's a great opportunity to see that development and conservation can go hand in hand, along with agriculture, fishing, and other traditional um, that, entities. So that's you. what we're focused on. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The chair recognizes herself. First, I want to commend Chairman Royce and the other co-chairs of the International Conservation Caucus for their leadership and efforts to ensure that the United States implements stronger and more effective conservation policies. I'm not only a proud member of the caucus, but I'm also pleased to sign on to the Delta Act that we have been discussing as an original co-sponsor, and I do sincerely hope that we pass this measure after our hearing today and quickly bring it to the floor for a vote. The Delta Act, as you pointed out, is vital to creating a transnational strategy that leverages the experience and the expertise of shareholders in the private and public sectors to combat wildlife trafficking and to spur economic growth in the Okavango River Basin. It also authorizes key U.S. assistance programs to prioritize and promote development through conservation and building partner nations' anti-poaching capacity. We have a tremendous opportunity before us to take action now while we still have the ability to protect Africa's most expansive inland water system, and it is still in, in all of our interest to do so before it is too late. Uh, we also have an opportunity to address conservation policy worldwide, and that is why this hearing comes at a critical time as we are now at a crossroads. The high demand for ivory in Africa and other wildlife products in Asia has seen poaching and trafficking rise to new levels, 
new levels that threaten the very existence of some of the planet's uh, most precious species. But this, in turn, has raised awareness and has led many nations to begin to take meaningful action to help reverse this trend. And key to this has been the United States leadership through initiatives such as Chairman Royce's End Wildlife Trafficking Act and through other conservation and trafficking programs as well as law enforcement efforts. Uh, many of our colleagues on this committee have focused in recent years on the role of transnational criminal organizations and terror groups in, legal, in illegal wildlife trafficking. The high demand for some of these products has made this illicit activity a lucrative one for these groups, and the lax security measures, whether the result of insufficient resources, corruption, or other deficiencies, makes this practice a serious threat to U.S. national security interests. By countering this uh, wildlife, uh, illegal wildlife trafficking activities of these illicit groups, we have the added benefit of cutting off a critical supply of revenue while also protecting endangered species. That to, to be successful, as you have pointed out, it has to start with getting host country buy-in. And it's not a one-size-fits-all. You have alluded to, so you have cited some examples of where it has worked in some countries. But in many, in many cases, state actors are complicit in these crimes with corruption, oftentimes being a major obstacle to accomplishing our objectives. We've seen this so many times in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, elsewhere. Um, so my question is, uh, how do we get host country buy-in from governments, from local law enforcement agencies, from local communities to join in efforts to curb this illicit practice when corruption is so pervasive and it's so lucrative? Um, Ma'am, you have touched on what I think is one of the core drivers uh, of this problem, of the conservation issue around the world, uh, corruption. Um, I think in many countries, many parts of Africa, corruption uh, is the elephant's biggest threat. Um, it, it can be very challenging uh, to find um, um, able and willing partners uh, in these parts of the world. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the uh, government of Gabon as their uh, advisor on transnational organized crime for two years, uh, and that was an environment that was very, very corrupt. We, we uh, literally for a while couldn't find a single judge in the country that wasn't um, on the take in order to bring the cases in. My, uh, the commander, um, Hubert Ekuga, who I worked with, um, was, used to say that uh, corruption was a far bigger threat to him than the, um, than the transnational criminal networks that we were trying to target. Um, but we were able to find, uh, slowly but surely, trusted partners, and with the support of President Bongo, we were able to put them in place. But it really did take that um, top-down support um, from the president, from the presidency of Gabon, and um, from his uh, uh, Secret Service and some of his police. If we hadn't had that, we would have been lost. Um, alternatively, in the project I worked on in Kenya, it took more than two years to get the Akashas uh, extradited, uh, and once they came out and some of them started cooperating, it became clear that everybody in the system, the prosecutors, the judges, right up to um, uh, some of the leaders of that country, were taking payoffs to stop their extradition from happening. Uh, and I can cite other examples in other countries. Thank it's you. Those are terrible, excellent uh, examples. It's a terrible problem. We do really need to um, make anti-corruption the focus, and it's one of the reasons that I argue the U.S. needs to use its extraterritorial legislation and not, assume, not count on the, the notion that some of these smaller African nations with very, very compromised uh, judicial systems uh, are going to be able to take down these networks. We're going to have to do it for them. Thank you so much. And I apologize, Mr. Stewart and Dr. Bennett. I went on too long and out of time. Ms. Titus of uh, Nevada. Thank you. I want to thank Chairman Ross, uh, Royce and the Ranking Member Engel, too, for making this a priority for this committee. Uh, I think it's very important. I'm a co-sponsor of the Delta Act, and I look forward to its passing. I also thank the witnesses for the things that they have done in this area, and I think the United States has made some progress. But I sense a trend that is concerning to me, and some of the things you've mentioned, I'd like to point out others. I think we're taking two steps forward and one step back. 
you look at what's happening lately, you've got proposed cuts to the budget. That's going to make it difficult to continue in this policy area. You've got several regulatory actions that have taken place with the Fish and Wildlife Service. You've got the uh, memorandum on trophy hunting. Now we're going to consider trophies on a case-by-case -case basis as opposed to having an overall policy. And the second one that's just coming out more recently is that the extreme hunting rules that allow us now to hunt baby bears and wolf cubs in their layers. I don't think that's a step in the right direction. And then third, you've, had, you've got Interior Secretary Mr. Zinke creating an International Wildlife Conservation Council. That's kind of like calling the agency that allows more pollution the Blue Sky Initiative. If you look at who's on that commission, it's somebody from the Safari Club, the Sportsman Foundation, the Director of Hunting Policy at the NRA, and several other groups that promote trophy hunting. Now, if we're going to lead by example, I don't think these are very good examples. And I wonder if y'all would comment on what you see as problems that might be created by this new trend under the Trump administration. Doctor. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we share your concerns uh, on all of those same issues. Uh, in relation to the trophy hunting issue, just picking up on that one, uh, it's a particularly important one because um, trophy hunting can be an extremely good conservation tool if used appropriately. And it uh, opens up, it, it keeps a lot of land, particularly in Africa, uh, but other parts of the world under wild habitat by giving an economic value for it if it's well managed. Uh, so, for example, we work on an operation on trophy hunting of markhor sheep in Pakistan um, and support the local communities there, and it's helping them to conserve the markhor sheep. But as an industry, it is notoriously corrupt. And the U.S., by having very strict regulations and a good policy previously, has not contributed to the problem. Um, but by loosening the regulations, then that really is a concern because it's corrupt in terms of... Uh, all on, the, all, all on the scale for getting licenses to hunt the wrong species, the wrong age, the wrong sex. Um, and while the exporting countries uh, where the hunting is being done, we don't always have a lot of control over, but we can have control over the importing countries for those trophies. So, yes, we, we share that same concern. Thank you. Peter? Uh, I also um, uh, want to second what... what um, uh, Dr. Bennett said about um, uh, hunting, in certain cases, being a, a tool for conservation. I also want to second what she said about um, uh, the importance of it being well regulated. That we've we've done a number of investigations uh, into um, poorly managed hunting programs uh, or or poaching that's taking place under the guise of hunting, particularly in places like South Africa with regards to rhino. Um, so uh, I agree, I don't think it's a good idea to be uh, loosening regulations in the United States um, around hunting. We, we have a fairly well-managed um, hunting programs domestically, and, and we should have the same level of, of legislation about it uh, internationally. Ms. Stewart, you want to add anything? Um. You know, I certainly think that international wildlife trafficking has a number of great allies in Congress, both on the Democratic on Democrat and Republican side. So I trust that those legislators will work to try to maintain and restore adequate funding for the international, international efforts and programs that the U.S. has been conducting that have been proven to be effective. Well, I think there's a lot to be said for legislation, for regulation, but also for leading by example. And a picture of a president's son standing over a dead elephant or a giraffe uh, doesn't seem to me to be leading by example at a time when uh, even China is moving in the opposite direction. So I think it should be an all-encompassing policy, not just focused on the uh, criminal aspects of it. So. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith and New Jersey. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for, to our distinguished panel for your leadership and for uh, your insights you've provided the committee today. Let me just uh, ask a few questions. Um, tragically, an estimated 30,000 African elephants are killed every year. Eastern and Central Africa continue to face high levels of poaching. In the last decade, these regions have lost 50% of their elephant populations 
And while populations in Eastern Africa have stabilized, Central African elephant populations continue to decline and remain deeply unstable for species survival. I wonder if you can explain to us why these discrepancies. If you could also add, you know, what happens in places like the DR Congo, <clears throat> where there is extreme, pardon me, <clears throat> extreme political instability. How does that exacerbate the situation? Let me also ask with regards to, um, and we've done this in the past, as have you, in, in trying to push for a greater integration of our anti-terrorism efforts, because obviously much money is derived uh, from this illegality. Uh, are we coordinating better on that front uh, to ensure that the LRA, groups like Boko Haram, uh, El Shabaab, and others are not deriving profits uh, uh, in order to fund their nefarious enterprises. And then finally, on the issue of reducing demand in Asia. Uh, obviously, the ivory bands in China, Hong Kong, and Singapore were very strong steps, demonstrated political will. But I'm wondering if you could tell us, and, and Dr. Bennett, you mentioned making it illegal how important that was in China. Uh, but is there also the perverse outcome where now that it is illegal, uh, it drives up the price, which again brings ill-begotten gains uh, to those who are poaching and, and selling um, uh, uh, ivory and other uh, products abroad. Uh, I wanted to just start by saying that I think that any time one is fighting a, a serious crime issue like this, there have to be efforts both on the demand side and on the supply side. Um, my, my work tends to be on the supply side, focusing on disrupting criminal networks, but one of the reasons um, uh, one of the many reasons I'm passionate about the conservation issue uh, is that there is some very, um, uh, I would say, proactive uh, work going on by a number of big organizations like Wild Aid. A lot of celebrities are involved. Um, there, are some, there are some creative efforts to um, figure out what can be done to spur demand reduction. And, uh, and as the other panelists have said, we've seen some very um, uh, positive signs from the government in China uh, to, to to tighten up its laws and to, to ban th these products. Um, so, but it's going to take work on both sides um, if we're going to save these species. Uh, my objective when I got involved in this, um, I never believed that we would uh, be able to stop all wildlife crime, but I thought that maybe we could knock some of the biggest networks uh, off course enough to give these species uh, the, the chance to come back. Uh, and I think now and then we've managed to uh, get a punch in, like when we got the Akashas extradited, but it's, uh, it's often hard to feel optimistic with the number um, of animals that are being lost. Now, you mentioned the um, uh, uh, conditions. I just want to make one quick comment about that, which is to say that um, even, there are some organizations that even in very, very difficult circumstances are, are able to save animal populations. There was a terrific story yesterday in the New York Times about Africa Park's efforts in uh, Chad and Zakuma National Park um, where they have brought back elephant populations. Uh, there's also a very interesting project uh, in Mozambique in Gorongosa which had, where the wildlife had virtually been wiped out by decades of civil war. Um, at great expense and effort they have uh, reintroduced a lot of species um, and that wild area is being restored. So. Uh, these areas aren't necessarily lost um, forever. We can bring these uh, populations back again. Uh, the rhino was almost poached to extinction in the 1980s, and its populations were to some degree restored. They're, they're uh, you know, under very, very serious threat again now. Um, but their biggest enemies um, uh, are crime and corruption. That, that's what we need to focus on fighting if we're going to save these species. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with Ms. Peters in a couple points. Um, on the supply side, I think we have to just make it as expensive and as harrowing as we possibly can to source ivory, to source rhino horn, to source these animals that drive it. Um, whether it's po meeting, meeting the poachers on the ground um, or disrupting their international networks, we need to hit it at all points of the, uh, of the chain. Um, I also agree with Ms. Peters. Time and again, it's been shown, whether it's in Grimetti in the Serengeti, whether it's in Gora, Gora, Gorongosa in, in Mozambique or elsewhere, that if you protect a habitat with a large carrying capacity, it will regenerate and the animals will come back. You just have to protect them. You know, you asked about coordination. I think there's a lot more that we can do on the defense and intelligence side in terms of engaging them. Our experience is that the U.S. intelligence, intelligence community can and wants to do more. 
Um, they've been tracking transnational criminals and illicit finance and deals for decades. And we've got to try to figure out how to build the systems that have been used in other contexts to enable classified and unclassified data to be used together to draw connections, <clears throat> to derive useful data so that the classified information can be protected, but the lessons drawn from that in combination with other information can give us the way to uh, disrupt these networks. There's more to do on that, but the participants seem willing. Thank you very much indeed for the question. Uh, to answer the question on why discrepancies, that's, some of it is tied in with corruption. Uh, why does uh, Botswana have the largest elephant population remaining? Because if you look at Transparency International's map of, of, of countries, it's the least corrupt country in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's one link to it. Another link is the fact that you've got the, uh, a severe difference between savanna and forest. Rainforests are, I mean, I can't even see from here to you in a rainforest, so looking out for poachers is incredibly difficult. You can do it by aeroplane in savanna. You can't in forest. So it's much more difficult to track and catch poachers in forest. And the other issue is that forest elephants have actually got a harder ivory than savanna elephants. And so it, for certain types of carving, it's preferred. And that means it has a higher price. So for all those reasons, the rainforest countries tend to be the more difficult ones to deal with on the, on the elephant poaching crisis. In terms of the ivory price, in the year prior to the ban actually coming into effect in China, the ivory price went well down in anticipation of the closure of the market. Uh, quite what's happening to it now, the market is closed, um, I, I don't know. But certainly in the year before, in, in uh, 2017, the ivory price went down very significantly in China. The one confounding issue that is going on in China, uh, which is a little difficult to, to know quite how to deal with, is the large amounts of sales of mammoth ivory. And if you go around the markets in southern China now, you see mammoth ivory for sale. And that's not illegal. There's more and more of it becoming available uh, due to climate change as the, as the uh, tundra in Siberia melt, and so there's more and more uh, accessible Thank you. mammoth ivory. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Bennett, if you can pull that microphone just a little closer to you. <coughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <coughs> Dr. Bennett, do you think the Trump administration is uh, helpful in its policies with respect to what we're talking about here today? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the core things that are a real concern that we've talked about here today, I mean, it's partly, um, as was pointed out earlier, with some of the loosening of some of the regulations. Um, but the most important thing is the, is the cutting of the budgets. And we are not going to solve this problem, and the US is not going to continue to be a leader in helping solve the problem while budgets are being cut, because the, it's vital to have the resources to do this work around the world. Well, Thank you. I mean, it, it makes one wonder about the commitment at all. Uh, la let me see. Last year, Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke suspended all of the Interior Department's advisory committees, including the Advisory Council on Wildlife Trafficking and Wildlife and Hunting Heritage Conservation Council. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. For that Was that one. a helpful step? No, it's not a terribly helpful step. And the, the, uh, the forming of the International Wildlife Conservation Council, as was pointed out, uh, with the composition of its members, is also not a very helpful step because it's, it's, it's not going to be a, a very objective panel. So the U.S. Task Force on Wildlife Trafficking, uh, which was codified by the End Wildlife Trafficking Act, has been inactive since Trump took office. Is that correct? Can you repeat the question? Sorry? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I yes, I can. I said since Trump took office, the U.S. Task Force on Wildlife Trafficking, which was codified in the End Wildlife Trafficking Act by this Congress, has been inactive. Is that helpful? Um, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that. Um, the Transnational Organized Executive Order on Integrated Wildlife Trafficking has been helpful, and that's been done under this administration. The Trump administration in his budget slash funding for international conservation programs, including cutting USAID's biodiversity program by more than two-thirds and eliminating the USFW's international species program. Are those helpful actions? 
no, those are, those are not helpful actions. And, and um, in my written testimony, we've actually put through all the cuts that are in there. And that's a, a very major cause for concern. Mm. Thank you. I just uh, think that's important to get on the record. Earlier this year. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, I, real briefly, yes. Okay, v very quickly. None of those cuts in the Trump budget actually went into effect, so they didn't really do anything, I think. Isn't that correct? Uh, I, t t reclaiming my time. <laughs> okay. Um, the point here is what the intent of the administration is. And while Congress has shown restraint uh, in, with respect to Trump budget cuts, we're getting at what is the nature of the commitment of this administration. And my point is that Congress notwithstanding, we're, we're retreating on the very things we're having a hearing about here today, led by the president and his administration. And let me give another example. Earlier this year, Ms. Dr. Bennett, the Trump administration reversed, because it loves reversing, Obama-era ban on big game trophies, including elephant tusks and lion hides, under the supposed rationale that such trophies actually support wildlife conservation. Um, is there any evidence that actually trophy hunting contributes to wildlife conservation, Dr. Bennett? Yes, it can contribute to wildlife conservation if it is well managed. It needs to be very well managed and very well controlled because it's so notoriously corrupt. One reason it contributes is because of the amount of land that is under game reserves allowed for trophies. Let, let me ask you, did you support, did the Wildlife Conservation Fund support the original Obama ban on wildlife trophy hunting? Uh, it was specific, the, the ban that I'm familiar with was the one that was specific to two countries which were particularly corrupt and were not managing their trophies well, and yes, we supported that. So do you, presumably then, if you supported it, you did not support the reversal of that ban? No, there needs to be controls. There right. really needs to be controls. Ms. Peters, any comment on that in terms of big game trophy um, not on the on the trophy issue, no. But on the I, I, on the issue of um, uh, cutting resources, I just want to say, have, as somebody who's been out um, on the you know on the front lines of of where law enforcement is fighting this problem, uh, those um, law enforcement officials, U.S. in particular, um, in Africa and Asia, are are incredibly under resourced still. Um, I've, we've had requests, for example, from the U.S. Treasury um, that would like to put some wildlife traffickers on the OFAC list, but they don't have any. But they've never been given any budget to investigate it. So they can they can only do it if it falls under some other organized crime issue. Um, I've worked with uh, agents from Homeland Security, Fish and Wildlife, Law Enforcement, Drug Enforcement Administration, where there'll be one or two agents covering 12 or 13 different countries in Africa, each of them racked by organized crime and corruption. We're still, uh, these, these folks are so under-resourced out there, um, and we, we really need to support them better and support um, uh, organiza private organizations that are out there trying to help So I, I take what you're saying Bottom line, it's bad enough as it is. C sweeping cuts in the program will only make it worse. Exactly. That's what I I'm thank saying. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we go now uh, to Mr. Joe Wilson in South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now yield uh, for such time as may consume to Congressman Steve Shabbat of Ohio. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I won't take up much of his time, but I just wanted to follow up on what my friend and colleague from uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia just said about. Uh, Trump administration's alleged cuts to various programs uh, that protect or save uh, endangered w animals or any would, animals Would my friend the yield? Uh, I, I don't, it's not my time, so I'll let me talk. Well, I thought it was your time. Only shortly, but it's Mr. Wilson's time. Oh. He yielded to me. Um, in any event, the cuts that were talked about in the Trump administration budget never happened. And then to say, Congress notwithstanding, well, our budgets and what we pass here, along ultimately with the president, whether it's an omnibus bill or whatever it is, that's what ultimately matters to these programs. And I think Congress over the years has been pretty responsible in a bipartisan manner to make sure that we are protecting as much as possible the endangered animals that we're talking about, whether they're in Africa or here in this country for that matter. So um, I, I just wouldn't want to leave the impression out there that because the president, in trying to deal with a $20 trillion budget, uh, and having limited ability to do that oftentimes cuts things 
all across the board. And then when it gets to Congress working with the administration, we generally together do the responsible thing, which is not to cut back on these important programs. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. And, and thank you. And uh, indeed, we appreciate the uh, active involvement by persons from Ohio and the uh, Old Dominion of Virginia. Uh, thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, and, and for each of you, uh, U.S. support for anti-wildlife trafficking efforts abroad focused on sourcing countries where the animals live, including in Africa, trafficking transit hubs, and countries with high demand. U.S. agencies involved in such programs include the Departments of State, Interior, Justice, and Defense, as well as the FWS and the U.S. Agency for International Deve Development. U.S. efforts support international conservation biodiversity goals, including law enforcement capacity building, support for rule of law, and prosecutorial activities. Sustainable conservation cannot occur without supporting local communities through promoting economic growth, strengthening health systems, creating jobs, providing education resources, resources and support for good governments. U.S. engagement includes working with national legislatures and departments of justice across the continent to ensure that the legal framework has clear and streamlined conservation and trafficking laws. In fiscal year 2017, the U.S. provided just over $90 million to conservation and trafficking programs. The U.S. also provides limited funding to multinational organizations that implement wildlife trafficking and conservation programs, such as the U.S. Development Program and the World Bank's Global Environmental uh, Facility. The question for uh, each of you began with Ms. Peters. Uh, promoting conservation and wildlife protection requires a whole-of-government approach with the State Department, USAID, Departments of Interior, Justice, needing to coordinate efforts abroad to combat illegal poaching and trafficking. Have you seen the coordination play out? What can U.S. do to improve our response? Thank you for that question. Uh, I would like to second um, a comment that Mr. Stewart made earlier, which is to say that the way that I believe that we can improve our coordination um, is to engage um, our intelligence community, national security apparatus, and law enforcement community uh, in targeting uh, some of the key networks trafficking wildlife because they're not just trafficking wildlife. Even agencies that don't have a mandate or interest in conservation should be interested in these networks for the myriad other crimes that they're engaged in. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And Mr. Stewart. Yes, I agree. I think there's the one area where is the greatest pr uh, potential for improvement is by, again, creating systems that ensure that we can use classified as well as unclassified data to, ident to draw the connections, to identify the links of how to uh, disrupt the uh, international uh, li criminal international syndicates that are involved in not only wildlife trafficking, but illegal fishing, human trafficking, illegal logging, et cetera. These are bad guys, and we should use all the resources we can to go after them. Thank you. And Dr. Bennett. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, the whole of government approach clearly is the only way we're going to tackle this one. Um, and by doing so, clearly by tackling wildlife crime, it's in a sense it's almost a soft way in to improve governance and, and uh, stability across some of these uh, troubled parts of the world. Um, but the, uh, the, um, in addition to the intelligence side of things, one of the other uh, sectors which would be really great to be fully involved is, is the financial sector to track money laundering and follow the money. And the uh, example of Al Capone comes to mind. We might not be able to get them on wildlife crimes, but we can get them because they are money laundering. And thank, and you. thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your thoughtful response. And thank you, Chairman Royce and Elliot, and Ch Ranking Member Engel, for the hearing today. And uh, if the gentleman would yield, we'll work with uh, Treasury on that weak link in the chain that you've raised, that you've both raised. Um, we go now to Robin Kelly of Illinois. I'd like to yield one minute of my time to Jerry Conley. I thank my friend from Illinois. I want to respond to my friend from Ohio. Um, nice try. But budgets reflect values. And the values reflected in the Trump actions in both the budget and with respect to advisory bodies and policies and regulations with respect to this subject, I believe create a hostile environment 
and show very little sympathy for the cause we're examining today in this hearing. And yes, Congress did not act on those budget recommendations. That doesn't mean they didn't happen. That doesn't mean those values weren't represented by the people who wrote that budget and signed by that president. And that's the point to be made here, and it shouldn't be covered up. And it wasn't an alleged budget recommendation. It was a budget. It was published. It was presented to Congress. It's a matter of public record. And I think it's a shameful public record, and it ought to be exposed. That's my point, and I yield back to my good friend from Illinois. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. As a proud co-sponsor of the Delta Act, I'm glad that we're having this hearing to highlight international illegal trade in wildlife. This issue is not only an environmental issue that threatens to wipe out populations of endangered species, but it's also a national security issue. Recently, high demand in Asia has been a driving force in the wildlife product trafficking in Africa. This has led to terrorist organizations like Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab engaging in the wildlife trafficking to finance their operations. Some countries in Asia, such as China, Hong Kong, and Singapore, have implemented nearly complete bans on the trade of the elephant ivory, including putting in place significant restrictions on the import of ivory and taking steps to stop their domestic ivory trade. The trade, however, has continued with illegal trade in endangered wildlife products, including elephant ivory, rhino horns, and turtle shells, worth an estimated seven to 10 billion annually. Dr. Bennett and Mrs. Stewart, with the prevalence of poaching on the African continent and its connection with terrorism on the continent, African nations are a key player in the reduction of illegal wildlife trafficking. What are the best cost-effective practices that can be immediately implemented to combat the trafficking? Uh, thank you very much. No. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the first ones is expanding what we know works on the ground uh, across different areas because uh, we have examples across Africa where actually wildlife is being protected well, but it needs to be taken up to scale. So we need to take our smart patrols and the resources and knowledge that we've got and take it up to scale across uh, more countries across Africa would be a, a, key, a key first step. Um, and, the, and the links with, uh, and to persuade governments, it's the links with security are really important. So, for example, in northern Cameroon, a few years ago, there, were, there was a slaughter of about 300 elephants in Bubunjida National Park. Those were not Cameroonians. They were people coming in on horseback, very heavily armed, from countries to the north. And so Cameroon was really forced to act on that because it was a security issue and a national sovereignty issue. And so these are all linked up. Thank in terms of immediate things, we need to scale up. Mr. Stewart, anything to add? Yeah, a couple quick things. I think the increase recently in the budget of INL and the State Department to address wildlife trafficking has been very helpful. They're great at addressing drugs and other issues that we've been more heavily engaged with over the years, and they're bringing that expertise to fight wildlife trafficking. I think support for training that the Justice Department and the local embassies have been doing is very helpful. Um, I think fish and wildlife and the attaches in Africa have helped provide connective tissue to ensure that enforcement agencies in different countries um, coordinate better. And finally, I think the Delta Act is a great example of the right path to trod here. Going in there, listening to countries like Angola, building relationships with legislators and the executives there, and then explicitly in the Delta Act, providing for a path to marshal assistance from government, business, and philosophy, for example, to help Angola on a large scale look at land use pla planning over vast tracts. I think that is critical now for helpful and will pay to be helpful and will pay off longer term. Um, and I think that will help show Angola and other countries who at least have expressed to us a very, an interest in diversifying their economy um, how to do it, that conservation and development are not inconsistent and will help foster what's needed on a regional basis. You know, I think President Masisi in Botswana will bring renewed energy from the Botswana side to address these trans transboundary issues. And as Chairman Royce has pointed out, there's a real unique opportunity in Angola right now. I'm gonna squeeze him while he's not looking. <laughs> How should uh, Ms. Peters, countries be framing um, the issue around uh, socioeconomic and political conditions, um, because if you don't have opportunity, then you tend to do things that you shouldn't do. So how can we 
look at other things that they can be doing beside this illegal trafficking? Well, um, th there are some successful alternative livelihood programs uh, in certain areas where, where that, that have reduced poaching. Um, there are also um, uh, numerous examples of, of um, places where the, the uh, conservation programs have um, shared the value of the, of the national park or the reserve um, with the local communities, giving them a stake in the success, uh, uh, giving them a stake in the conservation. Um, and those, those tend to um, make the communities um, uh, work harder to protect the animals. Um, but but my, my other, the other panelists have, have both made this point better than I do. It's, this isn't the area that I work in, but it's, it's extremely important. Thank you. I yield back. Yeah, one, one thing I'd add in that, uh, Robin, is that what we have here in, in Angola now is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because we have peace, we have a new government there, we've got the opportunity to engage Angola and Namibia and Botswana uh, to preserve these resources. So we go now to Mr. Ted Yoho of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you all sitting here and uh, very informative, and I appreciate the work you've done on uh, the endangered species and wildlife trafficking. Okay. You know, it's a scourge of humanity, these people going after, you know, killing thousands, tens of thousands of elephants and uh, rhinoceros, and we'll do anything we can to support that, and I uh, commend Chairman Royce for the work he's done over the years. And, uh, you know, it funds so many bad behaviors that work against civilized societies um, but then you've got a, I think one of you brought up, you've got the hu human encroachment, you've got development, you've got the illegal trades, whether it's drugs, human trafficking, or um, wildlife uh, trading. And then I was reading uh, from the International Union of Conservation of Nature, uh, made quite clear on the reason of the recent decline playing uh, on the addicts, playing the blame firmly on poaching by soldiers, and these soldiers were employed to protect Chinese-owned oil installations in Niger. Um, and we see this over and over again. You'll have a, a country that comes in, uh, they don't have the same values we do, and they'll do whatever they can for riching their own country. Um, they went on to say that um, uh, the, IU, the IUCN said uh, the addict's habitat and the surrounding region became a hotbed of drug smuggling, weapons, weapons, weapons trafficking, political insurgency and illegal wildlife trade following the collapse of Libya, as we all know. Uh, Thomas Raybell of the Sahara Cons Conservation Fund added that the companies with commercial interests in the region, notably China National Petroleum Corporations, should cooperate with wildlife authorities to contribute to the ADEX conservation. And I think that's something as these com companies and countries go in to develop resources, there has to be some kind of connectivity that if you're gonna do this, you need to work to protect and preserve these. What are your thoughts on that? Thank Dr. you very Bennett. much indeed. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it, it is a problem, uh, but it's a problem that we are increasingly aware of and doing our best to address. And one way of doing it is, for example, on INL funding is, is getting the links across the continents. So, for example, we now uh, have someone uh, working with us um, and the, well, with WCS and the government in Uganda to work with the Chinese business community in Uganda to make them aware of the poaching issue and to be, become supportive partners. And if that works, it's a new program, but if it works, that can be a really nice example of engaging the Chinese community working in Africa. Do they have any other, any other countries have, or those countries over to their... Do they have any um, uh, policies in place that conservation must be uh, a policy of development of those resources? Does anybody know? I'm not aware that countries have that as a policy. Mr. Stewart? Afri you mean African nations having that as a policy? Yeah. I think Botswana over the years has been particularly um, rigorous in scrutinizing um, investments by uh, the Chinese, but I'm not sure how formal that is. Okay, Ms. Peters, do you have any, any idea? Uh, I'm not aware of any country having a... Um, Sounds like that's something for us to do here then, doesn't it? That we can direct some of that. Uh, we've got a new uh, foreign aid bill going out that's tied into USAID that we can help direct some of that. And I just wanna add that uh, also the IUCN also said uh, additional efforts 
to monitor and secure attics in the wild as well as broad range of other conservation actions include rebuilding wild populations with captive bred, i.e. hunting preserves. And if you look at, and this is where we run into a little bit of a problem here in the United States, uh, if you look out in Texas, there's uh, 11,000 orcs um, in captivity. Uh, there's over 800 uh, dama gazelles and over 5,000 addicts out in, in Texas, and they're on hunting preserves. And we have a problem because people, if they hunt them, they can't keep the trophy. And I know that goes against what Chairman Royce uh, is advocating, and I think there ought to be a way that we can come to an agreement that if they're captive raised, you can tell by DNA where they come from, and we can select that way, that it's a way of preserving these breeds uh, that are being decimated and extinct around the world because of illegal activity, and it's ironic that one of the things that's gonna preserve them is the thing that does kill them. It's the hunting preserves that have good conservation measures in there, but it says in here that the ranchers, that they can't keep these if they're not allowed to hunt them. And if a person can't take the trophy back, they're not gonna hunt them, therefore those are gonna go out of business and it's gonna put more pressure on the wild. So I, just throwing that out there for consideration and I uh, appreciate your time and expertise. That was uh, Dr. Bennett, do you, do you wanna comment maybe on some of the complexities or trade-offs of this and maybe what could be done in terms of conservation management and with this respect? Uh, You'd, you'd mentioned earlier, you know, that one of the concerns you had with uh, the situation in um, um, in two countries specifically uh, uh, where there was corruption, that there wasn't a way forward in terms of proper management, but that it, it might be possible if we eliminated that corruption uh, to have an effective program that would actually help sustain these populations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, that's that's exactly right. If it's well managed, and I mean, as, as uh, and I'll take Tanzania as an example. And Tanzania has 40,000 square kilometres under national parks, totally protected. Uh, it has 140,000 square kilometres under game reserves, which is maintained as wild land by the fact that it's got some economic money uh, largely coming from lion hunting in that particular case. Um, and so if you lose that 140,000 square kilometres, you've lost a very more than half of the wild lands for wildlife within Tanzania. But the industry is notoriously corrupt there, the, and the... so. But if we can get it so that it is well managed, and that's going to take a huge amount of investment, and it's going to take a lot of work by a lot of people, and it's also going to take a lot of open-mindedness because a lot of people are not comfortable with it as a conservation tool. Um, but if so, that could keep a lot of lands under wildlife that aren't under wildlife, uh, that otherwise would turn into sort of uh, soy plantations or something like that, and we'd lose right. a lot of species. But it does need to be very well regulated and managed, and we need to be able to get hold of the corruption. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. We go to Tom Marino of, of uh, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I have been known to be an animal lover to the point of when I live out in the country of stopping my truck and getting a turtle out of the middle of the road to get it over to where it's headed and slamming the brakes on for a chipmunk. Uh, as a state and federal prosecutor, I have put, uh, we have put people in prison domestically for hunting out of season for shooting protected animals and birds such as uh, eagles, uh, and for importing hides and of uh, protected animals uh, internationally as well. Uh, I like the idea because we put some people away based on the fact at the federal level that we followed the money and as a prosecutor, as a U.S. attorney, I did that consistently in drug cases. Follow the money. You may not be able to get the person with the drugs, but you can follow the money and uh, put them away from that perspective. Uh, 
I'm constantly watching the programs on the History Channel and Discovery about what we are doing to worldwide uh, uh, animals and how we are losing them. I've been known to get in a couple of uh, fights with people who I see beating a, an animal or a dog or a cat or something to that nature. That's how obsessed I am with this because who's gonna protect animals if we don't? And often these individuals are called animals that do this, but that's an insult to the animal kingdom, calling somebody 